Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Courier 13 podcast with Winner Andrews. My guest on the show today is screenwriter and director Rowan Morrissey. Rowan has gone on to make many great short films and continues to unabashedly plan to create his next short film despite the COVID-19 pandemic. Rowan and I talked about a lot of things, the mindset of wanting to strive for a creative life, the ability to see yourself as a filmmaker, and also planning on the evolving industry that's going to reappear once the COVID-19 vaccine is distributed and things return to normal. Well, guys, again, thank you so much for tuning in. If you like this episode, remember to hit that subscribe button and please leave a like on this video. I would really appreciate it. And if you want to follow the podcast on Instagram, just follow it at Podcast Career 13. I'll uh, post all the announcements of when episodes are coming up, as well as potential backs, uh, behind the scenes stuff, as well as uh, highlights of episodes. So guys, thank you so much. And without further ado, let's start the show. This is the Courier 13 Podcast with Winner Andrews, a weekly think tank of in-depth conversations among rising filmmakers. My goal with this show is to showcase the innovative talent and ideas that Hollywood hasn't discovered yet. Okay, we're recording. Delicious. <laughs> how how are you doing, man? Well, what's up? Uh, I'm doing I'm doing good actually. I'm doing very good. Um, it's been a rough quarter. It's been a rough fall quarter to say the least. Yeah, yeah. And uh, but you know, last few weeks have been pretty good. Last half of November have been feeling pretty good. Last two weeks have been pretty solid. Why? Why? Why have they? Why have those weeks been more solid? Well, why? Why now? I don't know. Like it just kind of like, you know, COVID. Like no one's in control of anything. You know what I mean? Right now, just because of mm-hmm. COVID, the world like you can't do anything. So there's that stress. Um, you know, personal family stuff was kind of going on. You know, so that was kind of a bummer. School was all online. Couldn't really hang out and socialize. Um, but these last few weeks, um, they just kind of felt like I was a little, I was able to kind of control things a little bit more, you know? So I did, felt you like just I like, to, did you let, did you let go of like your desire to control things? And then therefore you felt like you had more control because you didn't like have that pent up anxiety about it? partially i think it was also kind of the opposite Mm -hmm. like i felt like a part of me was kind of felt more reliant on like external forces i guess and i think it i kind of just it felt like the last few weeks i was like okay i'm gonna take things into my own hands right Mm -hmm. things have been bothering me like okay i'm kind of just done letting that eat me away so i'm just gonna like finally do something about it you know what i mean kind of like that a little bit if that makes sense so what what was what was bothering you i mean i guess if, if you want to share i mean it's not too personal but like was it like was it more personal stuff or it was more like your work or whatever like you were working on um well it's funny um the so the personal stuff i won't get too much into but the work stuff that. the work stuff was interesting because it that didn't really bother me so much because it was weird like the work stuff like you know getting projects off the ground writing and you know even just going to work and doing school work you know like school work is always kind of always going to be like okay that's always going to be kind of tough it's always going to be stressful you're always kind of going to feel scrambled right Mm -hmm. so that kind of is like you know inevitable so I couldn't control that but like work stuff was career wise, career planning. Yeah. Um, that when it, it right now it feels out of control because we can't control where we're going with it. Mm-hmm. So I was just not scared about it. Or I'm still not because it's like, what am I going to do to like try and right. play it because it's like, I can't do anything. Right. Yeah. So if for me, it was like, 
I was so freaking out, like, okay, you know, LA quarter is canceled. Like I can't do that anymore. And like my whole plan, plan A, plan B, plan C was just completely thrown out the window, yeah. like the beginning of this quarter. So I was just like beginning of it, just like, oh my God, like what the hell am I going to do? Like, I'm going to have to like stay in Chicago more, lo- like longer than I thought I was going to have to, or I'm going to have to move out. And then like that, ne- you know, it was just kind of all that stuff. And I was just kind of like, okay, work stuff. It's like, look, nobody's working. Nobody's really advancing in film or TV right now, at least not at the rate that normally we would be. Mm-hmm. So there's nothing for me to really worry about. So for me, I was like, all right, I can't worry about my plan A not going to plan. So I'm hmm. just going to forget that it just didn't happen. Okay. And it's like, here's what I have. Here are the resources that are in front of me. Let me just kind of stick to the process, trust the process for the circumstance that I'm in and roll with that. Yeah. So for instance, um, the I'm directing this film uh, we're, it's been kind of in a rough patch. We started in July with pre-production. I think maybe like more like June. Mm-hmm. Pre-production in June. And we were going to film in August. What's, Clearly what's the film about, happen. if you don't mind me asking? It's, uh, it's a short film my buddy Carson Reek wrote. Call, uh, it's called The Phoenix. Uh, it's about this guy, uh, this middle-aged man who's essentially... Um, he's blaming himself over an incident um, that occurred 40 years ago that he never had control over. And he's sort of having a hard time realizing that Mm. part, I guess. Kind of of that interesting? Yeah. Yeah. Um, So that's kind of like the gist of it. And so we were going to film in August. Didn't happen. We were going to film November for a brief moment. Didn't happen. Then we were going to film January, beginning of winter quarter, January. Didn't happen. Now we're <laughs> looking to film spring break. Fingers crossed. See what happens. We're not locking anything down. So for me, like all that was so up in the air. And like we went through um, several crew members that kept flushing in and out. Trying to find crew members has been stressful. Going through rewrites with the script have been kind of not so much stressful. That's kind of a given. But trying to like plan and like get something definitive stuck, like a location or even like a date or even like, you know the, what I mean? The, like the, the, the things that you have that are kind of a given in normal circumstances where you just make it, you make it a one-time decision. And then you're mm-hmm. like, oh, I've made that decision and now I'm good. Especially with like a, a shoot date, like a, a shoot date, you're just like, okay, we've decided it's going to be this. Now it's going to be this. Now all of those givens are now variables. Yeah. So it's all up in the air, way more than I think it normally should be. Yeah. So we're all trying to, the three of us um, are trying to get this made and it's just not working. And normally like most people, like if it was under normal circumstances, would be like totally freaking out because like under normal circumstances, everybody else would be making something. So if I was in this situation in normal circumstances, I'd be totally freaking out because it's like, holy crap, we can't get anything up off the ground. We started in June and now it's almost January, mm-hmm. you know, but I'm yeah. not worried about it now because it's like, I can't control what the city puts in place. I can't control what the school puts in place. I can't control what the government puts in place or what the universe puts in place. Mm-hmm. So we got to roll with it. Yeah. No, and, I mean, yeah. Well, it's not, I mean, one thing that you're highlighting, well, I think this is just, this just goes beyond like filmmaking. This is just like a humanity thing. It's right now, no one's not affected by it. Mm. So no one can, no one can pretend, no one can pretend like it's not affecting everybody. And I think that actually is helpful because it makes everyone, especially filmmakers, sit down and inwardly reflect on that. And I think it provides, as you said, kind of, in a weird way, it's like a kind of comfort because you're like, well, we're all in the same boat here. We're all trying to figure this out. I don't have to burden myself with this unnecessary stress. Yeah. That's just going to make, I mean, that's kind of why I, what I decided was just like, 
after a while because I, I was in the same boat like I just felt like every day I felt stressed because things were not set in place anymore um where it goes to like I mean I'm in I'm in pre-production and post for two different projects yeah. and both processes have been elongated and messed with because yeah. of COVID same so it's just it's weird. Like you're just like yeah. just, it's it's already weird to be like ending something and beginning something, and then you add on a pandemic, and yeah. it just then your mind's just like, Phew. yeah. But but for me, I I think I think I guess it seems like both of us reached kind of like the same conclusion in a way. I just got to this point where I was just like. I'm, uh, I'm offering like, I'm like resisting this state of the universe. Yeah. If that makes sense, I'm like, I, if I resist this, like resistance to this is what's causing me to suffer. And it's actually making me yeah. less um, efficient and less yeah. productive because right. I'm wasting my time resisting this state of being. Yeah. So I, I just felt like, and I know this is going to kind of sound weird to people, but I just kind of just my mantra, at least as of late, which I feel like has been very helpful with my productivity, has been to just be like, well, today, I guess I'm in the right place in the right time, because this is the only place in time that I can be in right now. So I might as yeah. well accept that this is the right place and right time and just do it. Exactly. It's like, one thing I've noticed is that, well, two things I've noticed is that to kind of summarize, like how I've approached the my work or my career planning is just i it's just i've just been rolling with the train at this point the mm -hmm. universe has taken the new direction with is the universe is a train and it's taken yeah. a new direction it just decided to like we're not gonna go north we're gonna go east this time and like i've been trying to like pull it back north right and it's just like why am i trying to pull a 20 ton train north when it's going yeah. 60 miles an hour east Mm -hmm. I'm just going to stick with this thing and it's going to eventually go back north, right? Or wherever it's going. Yeah. So for me with clear career planning, it's like, okay, the universe and the world and time and whatever, right, is going in this direction. So I just have to roll with that. It's mm -hmm. me trying to like act like it's everything. Like it's not a thing. It's not going to help you. Not going to help. And then the other thing that's kind of given me a lot of reassurance is that everybody in the film industry um, that's not like a global superstar is all on the same playing field again. Nobody's working. Nobody's practicing their craft, at least not to the scale to the degree that they want to. There's right. some it's stuff limited. going on. Yeah, it's it's limited. You know. Yeah. Like all the students in film school are in the same spot as we are. So like, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So for me, it's like okay, well, I'm in the same spot as you know the kid that just won like a student academy award last year or whatever you know what i mean sure like i'm in stagnant with a project they're probably stagnant with a project you know subjectively artistic merit is like a side right that's always gonna be a thing but like in terms of progression in terms of building craft or building um experience it's kind of the experience level is the same you know what i mean yeah in terms of getting more hands-on stuff Mm -hmm. we're all kind of in the same boat like what you were saying and so for me like career planning it's like you know i'm calling internships and uh, co calling internships calling companies inquiring for internships and things like that and it's just kind of like everyone's kind of looking for it you know we're all kind of film students so i mean yeah, that's that's just helped me like in that you know search i guess it's like you know we're all kind of in the same boat so Nothing to be too afraid out about. And plus, you know, it's just like, hey, they're people, you know? So there's nothing to be too scared about with that either. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, I just I just got finished up with uh, with an internship with uh, this little production company called Romark, Romark Entertainment. Oh, yeah. Uh, it was just like a script. It was, you know, it was a script coverage, script research kind of a thing. Um, but every week we would have like our week meetings, like on Friday evenings. And my supervisor, this guy named Jake, really sweet guy, really knowledgeable about the industry and just the development process. 
like just feature development, just like just getting scripts, you know, signed on to like production companies and studios and whatnot. Um, he was like, yeah, no, this is a terrible time for everyone. Like, no, like this, like the, like the town of Hollywood, so many people are losing their jobs. Yeah. It's, it's a madhouse, or, or at least it was, it was a few months ago. Like a few months ago when this was really hitting, you know, in the early fall and late summer, you know, and so many things are changing now. Yeah. It, the, the industry, when this is over, the industry is not going to look the same. No. Um, They're going to have arcades and movie theaters. <laughs> 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 well, they actually there's 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 a movie theater by by my by the house I grew up in that actually does have an arcade in the movie theater. Mm, interesting. That's actually kind of dope. But Trailblazers. <laughs> trail, no, I'm like yeah. Now that you said it, I'm like yeah. I guess they're like they were ahead of their time. Uh, yeah, Seven Bridges, Cinemark, Woodridge nice. <laughs> represent. <laughs> um, but yeah, so. The studios are trying to hold on to their last light dying breath, even like Disney. The mouse is not going anywhere. <laughs> I mean, the mouse, I doubt that the mouse is going anywhere, but it's hard for them too. Like, that's what I'm saying. It's like, yeah. it, it goes back to yeah, what you're saying. Is. No one isn't at least kind of being affected by it. Yeah. Like, you know, the, I just like, you know, they finished filming, um, uh, well, I think Universal finished filming uh, the new Jurassic World movie, Dominion. And I believe they spent an additional... It's either... This is like a weird number. Because it's either... They, they spent an additional, I believe... I thought it was $6 million, but it could be $60 million, But I'm pretty sure it's $6 million. They Still spent a good chunk of change. Like, yeah, they spent an additional $6 million on top of budget to um for covid uh sanitation and testing and safety protocols the whole shebang right um and they filmed like an extra two or three months or something like that so they extended shooting a lot and they so they fin they finished filming a few weeks ago or maybe a month or two ago mm -hmm. during covid like they kept going it was one of the guinea pig films that they were testing out so that was interesting i'm not sure where i was going to go with that um <laughs> but, so <laughs> well i mean it's honestly i think it, it probably because i was i mean i i took a pre, pre pro class with this you know timothy Pedernell. yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, i took his pre pre-production class and excuse me and he said i think that for some of that big hollywood budgets in fact you said it was either six million or sixty million. I'm probably thinking it was sixty million because I don't know. I mean, I don't know how long that 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 Jurassic Dominion movie was shooting, but I assume yeah, it yeah. was like how long? Like, what is it typically like ninety days? Yeah, I. Uh, that's a good question. I mean, we, we could look this up. I was just about to look it up. Like, what did they you spend can even, You can on... even screen share. I mean, we're on Zoom. You can screen COVID share. COVID costs. They spent $3 million on COVID. That's what it was. 100 days, 40,000 COVID tests, millions of dollars in protocol. That's what it was. But but they were all, but I mean, that all, it only cost them $3 million? About. It probably yeah. was a little more. Um. I mean, obviously, that's still. I mean, that that. I mean, that's a lot of money, but I mean, for oh, them, six to eight million, six to eight million in protocols alone. So, I mean, my I was talking about this with my professor, right? Mm -hmm. And like, you know, if they spent six to eight million dollars on Jurassic World Dominion, mm -hmm. right? Oh, that's like a hundred sixty-five million dollar movie, just for safety protocol stuff, right? For COVID stuff. Yeah. Um, that's one movie, and sure, like. It might be pocket change to them. There's another six million, mm -hmm. but financially, I've, at least I've always kind of considered like you know I don't know how many studios are willing. Like if you took like the amount of movies that one studio makes a year, it's not as much as it used to be. Right. You know what I mean? But if you took like maybe one studio makes, I believe it's seven. Yeah. Movies a year. Like that's like it's like that. that's the high tier. Like you 
get seven in a year if you're a yeah studio. and i could be wrong i believe it's less for one like major studio like a universal or a warner brothers but i you you're know, like it's like five or six or seven somewhere around range so yeah. if you can imagine like all those movies at least you're spending three to six million dollars on each of those movies additionally on top of budget just for covid costs so that's adding to your overhead that you you know have to pay off right away you know what i mean mm -hmm. at least that's how i'm right. interpreting it financially so yeah. like it's a lot that's going to end up in the end of the day like you're spending like if you take those five movies three to six million dollars times five like you're looking at another mid-range movie that you just couldn't fund because of covid and it may not mm. it may not seem like a lot but it's like okay you have to like lose the you have to lose the gamble of maybe investing in a property that could turn you a small profit at least in the end run just like to keep people safe on five movies right yeah. right because i mean obviously of course the the criticism of of the big studios is that they don't invest in you know better scripts or you know more interesting mm -hmm. scripts or more unique scripts just more stories that are more out there and right as you're saying even with with this ex with these expenses even though to us they don't seem like a lot i mean knowing from the development they're they're probably not gonna buy that like mid-tier yeah. budget script that's kind of interesting and cool if they don't think it's gonna you know if, if they have to pay those costs yeah, they might get, I wouldn't be surprised if they got a little bit more selective. And that's given like they really want to shoot during COVID. I know that they do, all the mm -hmm. studios. Yeah. But say this goes longer. They have than to. What, if they don't, streaming know? will yeah. literally just kill them. It's a, then it's like they're, you know what I mean? It's yeah, like, like they have to rely on like old IP at that point. Yeah. So, yeah. So, like, like if they wanted to shoot through streaming, or I'm sorry, shoot through, shoot through COVID, mm -hmm. right? And, you know, keep that three extra three to six million dollars for COVID per movie. Yeah. And that might go down once they kind of probably get like permanent system set up, right? Um, but for now, at least for at least a good six months, maybe to a year, that's going to be like the additional costs. Um, there, I wouldn't be surprised if they became, in terms of movies, if they became more selective on like, okay, what movie do we want to put effort into? Because our budgets are a lot smaller. We can't just throw $50 million for some B-rate movie that's only going to turn a small profit somewhere in Europe. You know what I mean? Right. At least that's my thinking. Yeah. Um, like, it's kind of like a weird, like, okay, cool. Like you have less money so you have to pick the better project because you have you know it's kind of more quality over quantity thing so it's like okay we kind of got to be a little bit more pay attention not that they're losing money but because they have to put more into covid testing right which yeah. it may seem like pocket change but to me it's like that's six million dollars a movie that you could add up between five movies mm -hmm. you know what i mean to go right. make another movie on top of it as yeah. even though it's only one movie that's coming out of it, but still, if you pick them, you know what I mean? You're just kind of like losing, I don't know. That's kind of like how I'm interpreting it. What other, what other big films are being made right now? I mean, you, you got Jurassic Park. Um, oh gosh. Um, see, I don't even know, that's the thing. I have no idea what's being currently filmed in terms of like, big budget high concept movies but i do know if you heard about like hbo max right warner warner brothers warner brothers releasing all their films that were going to come out in 2021 they're putting all of them on hbo max on christmas and they're going to release them in the theaters really so what really so what is what does that encompass that i don't know i was talking about this with my roommate I haven't read the article fully yet, so I can't quite gather a good enough opinion to say why they're doing it strategically. My guess is that I think they're doing it to boost HBO Max's streaming traffic. You know what I mean? I think they're trying to draw more attention to HBO Max. Yeah. We've Which I mean, HBO Max is amazing. I mean. Yeah. It already has great content, but when you yeah. think about it, 
you know, all these studios, you know, none of them really like Netflix, but why they're owning their own streaming services. Mm-hmm. So, you know, HBO or Warner Brothers that has Wonder Woman, Dune, and like eight other movies all coming out on the same streaming platform. Yeah. It's, it's like they're trying to bulk up HBO Max's library. Yeah. Because it's, I think if I remember correctly, I believe it's a lot cheaper than Netflix, HBO Max. Uh, well, since, especially since Netflix raised its price recently, it is. Now okay. HBO Max is definitely cheaper than Netflix. How much is HBO Max? Maybe like 12 I bucks actually, a month, probably? I actually am a HBO Max, you know, subscriber, but I don't know the. <laughs> <laughs> um, let me. It's fourteen ninety nine per month. Okay, so it's about the same price as Netflix. Um, well, so actually, Netflix is like because they just upped it. It's fifteen, right? Netflix subscription cost. Yeah, no, you're right. In, in standard Netflix subscription increases to fourteen dollars a month. Yeah. Okay, so about yeah, the same. About the same. So HBO Max, right? You know, they they've have they've been in the game pretty for a while premium cable and stuff so they have like pretty consist like consistently good content on hbo yeah. max right from yeah, all of those library shows. yeah all of their shows so they can charge that price you know and maybe like yeah. oh they can pull some people from netflix and so i think they're really doing that so they could you know bulk up their streaming service draw more attention to them hopefully more people will leave Netflix or at least that conversation is going to start being a more realistic conversation. Cause right now there's so many shows coming off of Netflix that Netflix never owned. So the licenses are running up mm-hmm. that are going to all these other streaming services. And then until Netflix has no shows that nobody wants to watch except stranger things, <laughs> then it's like, what's the point of paying 15 bucks a month? Cause the only reason why people bought Netflix is because, Oh, I can watch the office. I can watch friends. I can watch cheers. I can watch mash. I can go watch, you know, you think all that's these other the reason why people shows. get Netflix. I mean, I like their shows. Originally that's why, right. Cause you had all this stuff on there, uh-huh. you know? Yeah. But for me, like, I watch Netflix and I'm not saying they don't have good shows. Right. Right. Ozark I've heard is very good. Mindhunter I've heard is very good. I love Orange is the New Black. That's a great show. The Crown. Um, I just started watching The Crown. I really, I'm really digging it. Very good shows. And, um, but I think uh, Stranger Things is really the only show that has mass audience appeal. You know? How Adults even, watch it, teenagers watch it, kids watch it. See, that's interesting. You know what I, mean? I don't even like Stranger Things that much. And that might be a controversial <laughs> viewpoint to have. I don't, that's not, but like, if I had to, it's not bad, but if I had to rank like my favorite Netflix shows, Stranger Things would not. See, I love not Stranger be, Things. Would not be in the, it would not be in the top five. Yeah. I got you. Well, mm-hmm. see, that's the thing for me, like top five, like, there's only like a handful of Netflix shows that are like stand out really good. I should pay an extra 15 bucks a month on top of everything else to go watch it. You know what I mean? I can agree with that. Like there's nothing yeah. for me. The only reason why I watch Netflix is because I'm using my parents' account and they watch a bunch of stuff on it. Mm-hmm. But like if I didn't have it, i had been like, okay, I'll buy HBO Max because yeah. there's a lot better stuff on it and they're making new stuff on it. No, it's true. For, they they, they Nef- have better TV yeah. shows. No for doubt. Netflix, right? If they imagine like so they take off if they don't have any of like the big ticket items anymore, right? Mm-hmm. For TVs and movies, they only have their originals and maybe a couple of cable channels like AMC or Nickelodeon, right? That kind yeah. of partner with them. Um, if they only had their originals, is it really worth that subscription? Because most of their movies, I'm not interested in them. Roma's very good. Irishman's very good. Beast of No Nation's very good, but that's three movies out of well, like however many they pumped out. And I know there's definitely more. Yeah, well, yeah, and well, but the, you know, yeah, but, but here's the thing: Netflix also does rely a lot on like. I mean, I watch a lot of like old, older movies, like some of the dramas that they bring back, like 
lot like when Irishman came out they had mean streets on there taxi driver like yeah. they had all of the like all yeah. of the greats on there and I was and that's what drew me back to Netflix a little bit so I think that, you definitely yeah. have a point there's there's with HBO I really don't go on HBO to watch stuff that isn't new I, I don't it's, it's yeah. only it's only like their great TV shows like all of their original TV shows and miniseries yeah that's where I go on HBO Max for. Right. Like the only reason why people are buying Disney Plus is because, oh, I can watch all the Disney animated movies for and seven Wars. bucks a month and, and all Marvel. the Star Wars movies and all the Marvel. Yeah. That's the only reason why they're doing it. But it's also the same reason why they're doing Netflix. The only reason why Netflix is there's like, oh, I can watch all these movies, classic and new. Because really for me, like how I see Netflix is like, oh, okay, cool. I can watch Friends. I can watch The Office. I can go watch some old Scorsese movies. I can watch all the Bond films. Mm-hmm. Oh, and Stranger Things there. That's kind of cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's all right. Yeah, right. It's fine. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like mm-hmm. they're, to me, like their original content is like, oh, that's neat. That's something cool. But for me, and it's not that it's bad stuff, right? right. The majority of it's pretty good. But for me, there's this oversaturation going on of television, oversaturation of content. It's great, mm-hmm. but it's like, I'm not going to watch half of these shows that you guys keep telling me to recommend because I just physically just don't have the time to watch all yeah. of Mindhunter, all of Ozark to get caught up with everybody. Just mm-hmm. because like, how am I going to do you that pick, when I have a bunch of You other pick shows? one show at a time to feel that way about it, but you're not going to get to every show. Right. Like, they're all on my list. Like, I definitely mm-hmm. want to watch them. But there's other stuff that I got to watch. And there's more stuff that I want to watch. So for me, it's like that all that oversaturation going on. For me, Netflix, it's like, I'm not doubting that, like, these shows are good. But I'm never going to watch it. And, like, if, you know, Peacock, HBO Max, like, they're pumping out all of, like, the classic movies and TV shows that I want to watch. The only reason why I went for Netflix and they're pumping out new stuff all on there. I might just buy all three of them to equal out 20 bucks or 35 bucks a month or whatever, mm-hmm. and just ditch Netflix and kind of be oh, yeah. sad you, that I can't you'd watch say goodbye to Netflix. Things. You'd be like, F it. I say this, I think Fuck I'm it. still gonna keep Netflix though, just because it's sure, yeah. it. and because it's just way more easier to access, which is why I think they're still doing really well. That and they've been true. around longer, so that's why they have the most subscribers. Yeah, they're established. Like, like when when you hear yeah. when you hear the word Netflix, you're like streaming. Yeah, you're streaming. I feel that. Like, it's almost like even Disney in a way. That brand kind of invokes a feeling and understanding. Like, I mean, yeah. Disney's like dominance. <laughs> <laughs> Disney's like yeah. complete control. <laughs> yeah, like, like Disney. It's Disney like they're like gonna they're win. Good. They're gonna win just because it's Disney. Right. And because all the parents, you know, every parent that's alive today at some point grew up watching Disney movies. So they want to show their kids objectively very good children's movies. Mm-hmm. So for $7 a month, I can keep my kid happy by showing them hundreds of dozens and dozens of Disney movies, yeah. quality movies. There you go. So they're going to eventually get that traffic. But it's Disney. Like it's so universal. Yeah, you know, so they're gonna get that, and I think it's. I'm very interested to just see how Netflix plays out, because I love the idea of all this content on one platform, and Netflix like mastered that for a while, mm-hmm. but that's changing, and now they're not that, and everything's separating. So now it's like, okay, where am I gonna like put my money towards, like a service that has like decent content, but none of the cool classic stuff I want to watch, or should I go? to the big studios pay their subscription fee watch the, all the old stuff i want to watch plus they're putting out new stuff that i know is probably really good yeah it's tricky because netflix is so much more convenient yeah i wish i just wish honestly that and this would never happen because money's involved and ego egos are involved but i wish yeah. all of these studios and all these streaming services kind of put their egos aside for a second and just make one like universal <laughs> service so we don't have to like 
yeah go back and forth and like have this like oh which one am i gonna take am i gonna you know have access to these shows or am i gonna have access to these shows and movies like yeah just put it all in one thing we'll pay you we'll pay it obviously it might be a little more money be like maybe 20 bucks a month we'll pay it and then all 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 these companies can just pull that shit like they can split that shit but of course they never do it because again egos but yeah and i think also monopoly you know monopolization the consumer (laughs) yeah yeah that too i think too like legally i don't think they can because it's just monopolies you know but but, they might get around it they might be able to get around it because if they're all in on it you know what i mean if they're all in on and they're all still their own private entities just working together like how sony and marvel work together for those spider-man movies yeah if they all like had just this agreement like well we're not merging as like one company but we've created this platform where we all can put our stuff on and all get a piece of the pie and i think you know it's just it's going to turn into like direct tv and dish again yeah. you know what i mean it's just kind of yeah. this is what it's the whole cable thing repeated again it's like okay we're all going to separate we're all going to be very charged oh no no one's buying it because no one's going to pay that much for you know, five different subscription services. Right, for all these different avenues. Yeah. So then it's like, hey, let's upgrade Direct TV, so they don't have as many ads. Put a little counter in the corner so people know how long these ads are, mm-hmm. <laughs> and then you could just that like, helps. yeah, you know, because honestly, like I would keep Direct TV if I knew that there was eighty seconds left of these commercials <laughs> in the corner. Like, really, who? that would be enough. If if you knew that, then 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 you could keep it. Totally fine easy wow yeah because direct tv like all those cable channels for like 40 bucks a month i have like 500 channels i mean granted mm-hmm. only like half of them are really not even half but like maybe a hundred of them are actually decent right you know but like yeah. still like okay like i get all of abc nbc cbs fx amc nickelodeon a and e paramount network the whole shebang right for about the same price that's going to be if they like you know merge everything in streaming i i just i just i just hate commercial so much can't stand them just the idea of going back to commercials would just be i would rather just no i couldn't do it i couldn't do that going back to commercials i I couldn't maybe maybe that's something that my mom would me because she would always like be upset when commercials pop down. She's like, why are these commercials so long? And I was like, yeah, these commercials are really long. Why do they take forever? Yeah. They always and do. There's always yeah. like 14 of them. And it's like, but they're all short. So it makes you feel like you're not watching a lot. At least that's how I felt about it. And see, I think like, you know, Direct TV and Dish would benefit if they like lowered their rates right for a standard package. I can't and believe just, those are still things. Like, is Direct TV yeah. still in business? Oh yeah, I still yeah I have it. My parents. Oh my goodness. Yeah, we have three cable boxes. This was a thing still. (laughs) Yeah, they still have it, and it's kind of nice to be honest with you. Uh huh. At some points, like I just like the only thing that you know Netflix has above um, Directv is that there's no commercials and it's far cheaper. Mm-hmm. And it's kind of like, oh, I can just log into my account and take it everywhere. Direct TV, I got tons of content, right? Um, it's different now because you need to be hooked up to the internet. But beforehand, I didn't need to be hooked up on the internet to watch TV, mm-hmm. right? So I can still watch a bunch of content, tons of different varieties. It's kind of convenient. I can record stuff that's on there, you know? Now I'm thinking about it, streaming. Streaming is just better <laughs> than cable, but there's just something nice about I don't know what it is. Maybe just because of I don't know. I kind of grew up with. I mean, I liked I I had I grew up with direct TV and I enjoyed it because I didn't know better. This was right. this was before Netflix ever existed, and I mean, I could definitely when I went. I mean, you know, I could definitely imagine if I was using direct TV again, it would feel familiar and it would feel like. It would remind me of my childhood. Right. It would remind yeah. me of this thing that this way of viewing content that we used to all 
subscribe to. We used to all, we, we used to all be a part of it. Yeah, and I think the only reason why like I still like have DirecTV, at least like my parents do, is just because they can watch the news. Because the mm-hmm. news isn't going to really do well on streaming services, I think, you know. Just because, oh, let me yeah. watch the news, you know. Kind of one of those, at least for me, I've always felt like, oh, let me just have it pop on. You know? Right. But, uh, let's How do you watch about. news? <laughs> what was that? How do you watch news? Uh, every I mean, morning. Do you ever watch the news? I try to limit that as much as possible. I've, it's interesting. Uh, this whole quarter, I would get up at seven in the morning. Well, I've, I always wake up at seven o'clock in the morning every day. Yeah. Sometimes eight, 8 a.m. on mm-hmm. the weekends. And I turn on CBS Morning News and I watch Gail King, Anthony Mason, and Tony DeCopel <laughs> for, like, for their whole morning news. <laughs> I watch the whole thing. Um, and then I'll try, but not all the time, I'll try and watch CBS Evening News. Okay. Um, but that I don't really try and look out for. I I, so I stopped do... doing that once a few weeks ago just because I was like, okay, everything's kind of just bad and I just don't want to, <laughs> to watch Every, it. Yeah, everything just kind of <laughs> sucks. And, um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, CBS is the only one, is the only cable network that I'll occasionally in a blue moon look at. And it's normally like they're eating, like say, like like when it was like election night, I watched yeah. the CBS late night thing. Yeah. Um, but I really try to avoid cable news like it's the plague. I no, and I totally understand that. Like I totally no. get it. Like I uh like I only really watch CBS. Mm-hmm. Um just from like taking journalism classes and you know not to get i don't want to talk too much about journalism but you I mean, know i just media, you know <laughs> yeah um i just feel like they're the most kind of in the middle i've always i've always felt um mm-hmm. that's kind of why i watch them and they're it's at least that maybe not so much that it kind of is most a lot about that but they take it seriously you know it's not like Good Morning America or the Today Show where it's like, let's not talk about real stories for an hour and then talk about real stories for an hour. You know what I mean? It's Here's like, you know, seven to eight or like, what is it? Seven to nine, is it? On CBS, it's like, Mm -hmm. here's the news. Here's what you got to go. Here's what's kind of important. Feel lighthearted stuff, you know, feel good stories in there. But here's the news. Here's what you should be talking about. And then I've always felt ABC is like, oh, here's three hours of news that's constantly repeated. That's more like a talk show. And I'm just kind of like, oh, this is kind of, I want information. You know what I mean? Like, I don't want to watch like a, I've never been a fan of like daytime television. So for me, like watching. I mean, talk shows are just weird, especially now, especially for what we're accustomed to. I mean, we're, we're, I mean, we're accustomed like uh, us, our generation, we're accustomed like, we're accustomed to long form podcasts. We're accustomed to like long in depth conversations where people really get to like what really is real and what matters. At least, hopefully, or at least that's like the intent. And yeah. you never get that. You know, well, you never get that on a, on a morning talk show. You never get that on a late night talk show. You never really even get it with the news. Like, I mean, I just feel like whenever I'm watching, like, like, yeah, news, political news people on cable shows, I just feel like, okay, whoever gave you this script that you're reading from, whether you wrote it or someone else wrote it, I feel like you're not really telling us what's actually going on. It's just like your perceived viewpoints, yeah, because of the people you work for. I feel like you're 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 yeah. just you're just you're just talking of, through the lens of whoever you're working for, and it's really weird. It just feels off all the time. Yeah, like even if I, I agree yeah. with what they're saying to an extent, like I even I go on CNN and like I even like I'm kind of agreeing with what they're saying. I'm like, yeah, but like. Is that really everything? Is that the full scope of things? I don't yeah. Know. 
like i that doesn't bother me so much because i think the integrity of journalism is to be the most unbiased straightforward factual thing you can possibly be mm-hmm. with little opinion to persuade because it's it's information it's news yeah. and so they have this really tricky job where like okay i have to give the people the straight up facts as best as I can so they can form their own opinion. Because mm-hmm. that's a lot of power to hold. You know what I mean? Like imagine just CBS just became this very biased news source and just twisted the information into what they want it, you know, the information to be perceived as. Like yeah. you would just have a third of the country just be like their point of view. So that I don't mind so much. My thing, I it's just like they're so that I don't mind so much that it feels like they're reading a script. What kind of I've never cared for with late night television, not so much, but a little bit and morning news and just kind of the news in general. Um, well, especially the world news shows, but is that it's, it's so what's the word I'm looking for. It's so like, robotic or it's so um not so much robotic it's like it's just the time like they're only given like so much amount of time to where they can't talk about as much right right and i think like seems archaic for for now especially with with everything that we do now and just how we communicate it just feels like it feels like the like the the old talk show format that they're still trying to cling on to that should have like died out in the early two thousands, <laughs> like that should have just like stopped. But they're yeah. like, no, this has been like a means of us making money for so long. I don't want to give this up. Or at least I feel like that's what that's yeah. the only yeah. reason that they're trying to drag these talk shows through the mud. And people even watch this stuff. I watched clips on YouTube. Because sure. like it comes down to like that for that, that rigid formula they follow. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? And yeah. I could see why they're keeping it. Because for people like us, right, we're film students. So for yeah. us to watch the news, it's weird because it's like, oh, it's so quick. They didn't dive deep into it. I don't know enough about the subject and I don't really know like what they're trying to say from it, right? So mm-hmm. I'm gonna watch a documentary instead. Right. But most it's of a lot Americans, better way of getting your getting your information. Right. But most Americans don't have the time or the interest to go watch an hour and a half of the topic they just found out five minutes from and then they get all the bare facts from it, right? Yeah. So that's why they're kind of doing it and I can get it. It's the same type of thing with late night. Like, oh, it's really late. You know, I don't want to go to bed. So let me just throw on some quick jokes. You know, I don't go, I don't want to watch either a long form comedy movie or i don't want to watch a comedy podcast for an hour i just want to watch like a half hour of conan just kind of throwing some one-liners and that's kind of being being weird really right so i can see why the late night shows are still doing that because if you want long form like comedy entertainment you know there's a lot out there that you can search for Mm -hmm. like those podcasts or those movies or tv shows or um you know, things like that. Yeah. Um, like a great example, I think, like for if you like really want to like know about the news or you really want like good in-depth news and it sounds like I'm like promoting like CBS, <laughs> but I'm not. Are is you being six... paid by CBS, Ronan? Is that uh, if, if I was being is? paid, if I was being paid by CBS, I would not be living in Oak Forest, Illinois. <laughs> okay. All right. <laughs> um, but like, I've always felt like if you want like in-depth news, like 60 Minutes, I've always felt does a great job with taking a little bit extra time to dive out those stories. Yeah. Dig out, dig them out. But if you really want to do more, it kind of is a bummer because if you don't have a documentary that really talks about that specific thing, you kind of got to go and research articles on it and, and stuff, you know? It's tricky. Mm-hmm. It's tricky. It is tricky. tricky to navigate the world we live in it is it's hard very tricky very hard what um so uh, you are and i'm also i mean you more so than i but we, we are both involved in the 
DePaul Theater TV Incubator, which is a is, is a group that comes together and well now we can't really produce a lot of stuff, but we're developing a lot yeah. of short form TV show content. Developing a lot of stuff. Um, I know I was I was at the meeting like two weekends ago, I think. And a lot of, I mean, it was the first time I had been there in a while. Um, what, uh, I mean, I, I think it might be cool to, to just kind of talk about like, what, what are you guys working on right now? Yeah, we're working on a lot. Um, I mean, I know one of the shows, because I was in the meeting for the development of one show. That was a show about the campus security. <laughs> what what's the te- what's the name of the show again? Campus security is the uh, name for now that we're going on. Uh-huh. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I'm excited yeah. for that. I we've been pitching that show for like three years. <laughs> for three years. It's been longer than that. Oh my uh, goodness! It's just one of those shows we do a zeitgeist at the beginning of fall and i believe sometimes spring quarter where we just try and break a new idea for a web series yeah. and campus security always comes up because at first it started off like hey what if we did a mockumentary it's like the office but it's about campus security officers i feel like that's just a community that has not been explored we haven't right. seen that Exactly. And I don't want to say too much about the project specifically because we got mm-hmm. some really good ideas going on. Yeah. Uh, but we've really dived, we've been exploring a lot about the show. It's going really well. Um, we have some very intriguing characters. Um, and so far, it's a lot of fun. Yeah, it's a comedy. It's kind of like a set up like a workplace comedy. Um, uh yeah workplace comedy makes sense yeah, yeah. <laughs> it, yeah to me it, it made me feel i mean you described it as like reno nine what is it what, what was that show oh, reno, Re- nine, reno 911 yeah yeah reno 911 and uh the office like that to me is kind of what it seemed yeah like. yeah it's kind of it's a lot like reno 911 uh, not a lot we're elements from it but i would say like yeah it's kind of that vibe yeah a bit, you know so there's that show going on there's this show called space squid uh this is the animated show space, that we're doing. okay wait a minute okay yeah i was not i was not in the meeting for this i didn't know that was a space it's squid space squid this is a another interesting show we've been trying to do an animated show for a while so this will be our animated web series that they're developing i don't know anything about the project Okay. But it's about this squid who's like an intergalactic messenger who gets caught up in intergalactic gangs, I think. I could be wrong. Gangs? On part. gangs like, oh, gangs. Okay. Gangs, I'm like, like I, thought, I thought she was like going to the, inter, like the intergalactic Olympics. I'm like, that was... <laughs> <laughs> That'd be fun, too. Um, I can't quite remember what that show is about, but it's about this little basically that's a messenger and it's kind of funny it's kind of cute i don't know how the development's doing on that one but uh last time i heard they're doing pretty well on it and then uh diner on fifth our horror anthology series we're beating out episode ideas so we can write episodes for it um alto's pizza uh we're having a meeting on that tomorrow yeah that i heard you guys are Mm-hmm. starting to do the scripting process so that's really good um esports is also still in that phase so there's a lot of projects they were making midnight pancakes is still going on um, yeah why okay i want to get into midnight yeah. pancakes yeah please <laughs> i've not been invited back to midnight pancakes that's okay we've only filmed one episode this entire quarter okay that's why so, okay yeah yeah All right. no we we've slowed down a lot uh because just like when fall quarter started everybody got so busy yeah and like i was so lucky to get we actually got two episodes in um we recorded one episode at the beginning of the quarter early august with jose yeah. uh it was me robert oh, his, um, jose was in it jose, jose soto jose soto oh, was our guest it was a very fun episode 
Professor um, Soto. Yeah. Right. So that was a fun episode. Uh, we filmed eight episodes over the summer. Um, seven technically, but eight with Jose. Yeah. Uh, so we filmed two over the quarter. We, I, mostly it's been a lot of like housekeeping work that we've been doing on that show, just kind of getting all of our producing stuff kind of in order. Um, make sure we have all of our footage and keeping track right. of everything and stuff. So, uh, I mean, we that have, pancakes was this show about it was it was like you we you had three to four people who were like on their own team and yeah. they were like each each person we were all the people were given one you know we had rounds of hypothetical questions that everyone was yeah. given like these yeah. weird insane hypothetical questions and then we had a debate why our hypothetical answer was the best kind of um yeah, it, well, yeah, the episode that you were in, that was like, yeah, we debated, but there were some Did where it, it didn't so much change. I guess it is kind of like a debate a little bit, like why? Okay, yeah, well, I guess because someone, I mean, someone yeah. wins, like someone has to like prove why theirs is the best. Yeah, I think that episode we decided to like vote for that one because they got into such a heated argument <laughs> oh but, yeah well yeah that i mean i remember we definitely maybe not maybe every episode we didn't like keep tallies but there was one episode in specific where we like kept like it was definitely it felt like we were doing a debate show and whoever had the most points at the end it like, set up a lot like game. a debate show it's, yeah it is so that's kind of one way to think about it it is a lot like that yeah we would discuss wacky hypotheticals, weird what ifs, situations and questions that you have with your friends at, you know, midnight, mm -hmm. up late at night that don't have any direct answer at all. It's sure. just, here's a weird fucking scenario. Here's a weird what if, here's a weird question that you're not going to hear on just normal, you know what I mean? What were the, uh, what were the weirdest hypotheticals? because <laughs> i know i mean i remember the weird hypotheticals that i had i guess from the times i've been but in your mind because you've been involved in prepping or have participated in all the episodes right Basically. a lot a good amount yeah a good amount know. so in in your experience what was like some of the really really fun? one of my favorite i have to give this this question's all credit to to rowan um she came up with, uh, what if our teeth were usually flaccid, but got hard for us to eat? I remember this. I was on the episode <laughs> where we did this question. That's such a good question. Because, like, how on earth does somebody come up with that? And then, like, okay, let's explore ways on how that would happen. And then, like you said, we debate, like, oh, I think, you know, we get hard when we eat an onion or whatever. You know what I mean? <laughs> like... Uh so then we would like what do was your answer to that how did you answer that oh i can't even remember because we kind of went down this road like is it like based off of food that gets our teeth hard or is it like a sexual thing or like how does it kind well, of right we, we we had to figure out like what were the parameters of the question like so like what is making your teeth hard yeah i can't I remember but we came up with a bunch of different scenarios like if it's food like is it like the smell of it or does like, is it more like a, like a sight thing? Like you see a food and then just like, oh, bing, they're hard. You know what I mean? Yeah. Or is I feel it like, like you would have to either yeah. smell it or, yeah, I feel like it would be the smell. Yeah. You smell some and then your teeth would get blasted. But yeah, no, that would fucking suck. Yeah, no, it'd be really annoying because like I was saying like, oh, does that mean like all of your teeth are like your tongue? How your tongue is like that? Yeah, yeah. Just to, like, like could you imagine like mini mouth? tongues, just like all of like thirty two of those tongues? I was so weird, and like it was so uh, it was such a good question because that's so weird, and like those are the, that's the things that we like are aiming to talk about, you know. Um, like another one that was pretty good. Uh, if you're stuck on a desert island with a mermaid, would you rather the mermaid be the top half or the bottom half fish? I can't remember oh. who asked that question, but I thought that was like kind of an interesting question. Um, to me, and, and it's it's obvious. What? You have the well, because I mean, 
Well, it depends on what your intentions are. If your <laughs> intentions are <laughs> that you plan on cooking this thing, because you could say, say you're on a deserted island or do you just find this thing? Stuck on a desert island. Okay, yes. No, now you know. You, you, you got it because that's the thing. If it's the top half, at least that midsection, that's going to be your prime filet. So, I mean, you don't, no one's going to want to eat the tail. That's true. Yeah. Yeah. Another question we had was uh, what video game will replace bingo in retirement homes when millennials or Gen Z gets old? Oh. That was a good episode. <laughs> I don't even know. That was, fun. Even that was a good one. Yeah, because we because th- you know like video games have been much more prominent in most of our lives. So is there going to be like an electric uh, vir- vir- virtual bingo, or is there going to be like you know what I mean? Well, no, interesting I, question. For me, I take that question is which video game that we're experiencing right now is going to be the video game that people play in nursing homes. Yeah, I think I made the argument of Minecraft. Minecraft is not that hard to do when you're older. I no, and I think when we get older, we're not really into the crazy action stuff. Yeah, there's something that's very like, oh, you let's just hop on a simple, let's steady. Hop, yeah, let's hop on a realm, play peaceful mode, build some houses. Yeah, you, you know. go at your own pace. There's no yeah. urgency. You just yeah, yeah. You know, and then it. yeah, if you're yeah. mentally cute, you know, unfortunately gets a little bit older, you still got Tetris. So, <laughs> so Tetris, you will always have Tetris. Yeah, I know. I feel like if I was if I was a chill. 80 year old person somehow I was in a nursing home, I would probably probably play Minecraft. Yeah. Probably would just chill out. I would too. Totally. I mean, I, I, I unless I felt adventurous and was like, man, I remember that Bioshock game? <laughs> <laughs> I want to play Bioshock. Oh, honestly, that'd be cool. Which is your favorite Bioshock? Now that we're on the, now that we're on the subject of Bioshock, which, which Bioshock? I've never played Bioshock. I've only played I've only played Bioshock Infinite. That okay. game was very good. Bioshock I, Infinite is pretty good. I played I still, a little bit of the first one, but not enough to say that I was an avid I loved the concept of the game. I loved the yeah. game. The story was pretty cool. I, I just never played it. <laughs> no, that 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 first game, which I'm kind of impartial at the first game's still I think my favorite. It's, I think what I love about it isn't even just like the, the gameplay, it's just the concept and the story that they created. Oh, it's so cool. Within. It's so well executed as well. It, yeah. When did, when did that game come out? When it first came out? Oh, I feel like, gosh. Early 2000s, like on the original yeah. Xbox. Yeah, because you're yeah. right. It's like, because I know they remastered it. They did. Yeah. They did. But, I feel like I always forget that that game is really, really old. The first one. It is. They, I believe, they've been trying to make this into a movie for a long time. Oh, I. They would be fools not to try. Yeah. I mean, it's so rich, but that, but that's oh, two thousand seven. But that's oh, still, it's not bad. Damn, so, Xbox three hundred and sixty. Actually, never mind. I was wrong. Xbox three hundred and sixty. That makes sense, yeah. Yeah, they've been trying to turn that into a movie for a while. And it's obvious the troubles that they're <laughs> having with that. Well, game. yeah, it's I mean you know? it, it's so rich, it's so yeah. dense that right, you're just like, okay, which storyline, which parts do I focus on here to tell the most tangible story possible? Which yeah, I mean, I would feel for Bioshock, that's actually a difficult task. I mean, just like the scale. Of just yeah. underwater, the, the creatures, you know. And I don't oh, yeah, think it, world. you know, like how to just do that justice, you know, to get the most out of it, to tell a good story out of it. Well, I feel like the world building, that wouldn't be so hard. Because I, yeah. I mean, I mean, you saw Aquaman, which I mean, was an okay movie, in my opinion. But like the world building, like the world that they created there was beautiful. And yeah. like you bought it. So I That's feel true. like. I could, I feel like, I feel like that's not as hard as just trying to hone in the narrative, hone in like the storylines that they're gonna, just condensing it to a script, just condensing the video game into a script would. Yeah, and like, that's like, like Uncharted has been in 
the same predicament too and that's like also kind of tricky trying to get that up and running you know kind of like for similar reasons i think because there's a lot of character stuff they kind of got to flesh out what do you want to keep what do you don't what do you don't what do you don't want to keep and i think uncharted's a little bit easier because it's kind of more like a movie so they mm-hmm. kind of have a like, at least the storyline is so they can kind of okay you know but you still gotta take liberties to make it actually fit a movie and make it work so right um, that's always the trouble with video games it's just like they're it's like a tv show they're really made like a tv show and when you try and make it into a movie uh you cut so much out to where like well you also you, a lot of the times you get writers that don't know anything about the video game to write it right so they're just like let me read the wikipedia page and just like do that here's a first draft you know what i mean and then they change so much of it because they don't understand what the story is in the game so that's why a lot of them are kind of bad um and a lot yeah, of they never i feel like they haven't been able to make a really great video game movie like what's a really great what's a really great video game video game movie yeah <sighs> really great one like damn that was really good see there's a lot of really good movies about video games like jumanji sure. that was pretty good uh-huh. um record yeah, yeah, shit no yeah i forgot about jumanji yeah like uh wreck it ralph um very good um mm-hmm. i think like the most successful was the resident evil movies but they just weren't good I was they very won. disappointed because I'm a huge Resident Evil fan. Huge, oh, are you? Huge. And when I saw the movies as a kid, I was like, oh, this is so cool. Like, it's a movie. But then deep down, I was like, no, these aren't that good because the stories in the games are just so much better. And the games are, ap- the movies are absolutely nothing like the game. And that's what I was like, wait, this Alice person? Nowhere in any of the games <laughs> at all. So like, why would you throw it in there? Like, you had all your work done for you. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. It didn't make sense. But Resident Evil 2 is tough, or Resident Evil is tough because it's really a TV show. It's really a TV series that that's like yeah. what it is, you know? I, did, I didn't see The Witcher. That's supposed did to be good. Did you see The Witcher? I saw some of it. It's pretty decent. Granted, okay. I never played the games, so I can't really compare. Uh, okay. But just yeah. the show alone, I was like, this is pretty good great yeah yeah so maybe that's maybe that's their mistake they're trying they're trying to make these things into movies when it's like especially how video games are made now because there's so many cinematic video games yeah it makes sense to just keep all of that rich material in there and just make a series out of it like if you got somebody who loves the video game who wants to write it into a television series i think that's your best bet yeah, like I've always wanted to write, I've always wanted to turn Resident Evil into like a Netflix series, you know, mm-hmm. and somebody totally could. bought it. <laughs> but, so but Netflix, you totally could do that. I, I think if someone came in, if you came in there with a really good Resident Evil reboot TV show script, and I think they take it. They already did. Perfect. Netflix already bought it. <laughs> Oh, they did? About yeah I, I believe i read somewhere that netflix is like considering it yeah fallout mm-hmm. as well and that mm-hmm. was my other backup plan was Fallout's oh! fucking great fallout so fallout good Fallout is so good and then now that's they're turning that one into it yeah that's smart netflix see you know we were yep. trashing on netflix earlier but right if they, they if do they, know what they do they know what to yeah. do about those acquisitions like they know yeah what's up. yeah they're like I apologize if you heard that. That's my brother playing. I, I, I heard. I, I. It's not no big deal. I heard. Something. Okay. okay. <laughs> um. You know, if Netflix can like pretty, you know, going back to streaming for a little bit, but if they can nail down like good acquisitions from video games, yeah, make them really good. They could do it. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's. I think that's the way to go. I don't. Again. Yeah not a big video gamer but there are a couple of video games like fallout bioshock that if they did that i would watch that i to- i yeah. totally be i'd be like netflix 
you got me. I'm not canceling on you just yet. You, you got me for at least another month or two after I binge yeah. watch all of those shows. <laughs> yeah, man. What? So, what? I always ask this of all my guests because I just think it's important for people to know that now that I, we're kind of like settling down here what why did you decide to be a filmmaker especially right now with all of this uncertainty oh that question um it's weird um for the longest time i was gonna go into computer engineering i wanted to really yeah i wanted to build computers like all throughout middle school like i just loved computers and i wanted to build them i wanted to like make i wanted to be a video game developer that's what it was. okay in sixth grade i wanted to be a video game developer and my teacher was like that requires a lot of math and fractions mm -hmm. and i was very bad at math and i was like nope yeah i'm not doing it then i realized that it's a little different than just knowing math and fractions, right? So she kind of got it wrong and I was kind of scared away from it too late to really realize that there's other things in game Man, that, that's that's so fucked up that like an yeah. ignorant teacher can like yeah. say something that will set. Yeah, it know. was kind of shitty. I mean, she wasn't wrong though because like there's a lot of math that kind of goes into it. But at the time, the technology that's so much advanced, like I'm pretty sure they don't use math to like, you know, it's not like they're coding anymore you know this program is yeah. made to where you know so it's a little bit different but yeah i'm sure there's a lot of math but i you know but i didn't know all the other different avenues that you could do in games like designing or developing or directing or just you know the management stuff i didn't right. know about any of that so i i gave up that I, I wanted to do computers and then i didn't really want to do that because i didn't want to sit in front of the computer screen all day and um I was in high school and like my mom was like, what do you want to do for like a career as a freshman? And she wasn't pressuring me. But I was like, mm -hmm. oh, fuck. I don't, I don't know what I want to do. I don't know. You know, and I knew that I didn't want to go into the trades because my my dad's a plumber. My grandfather's a carpenter. Uh, four of my uncles plus my aunt are carpenters. One of them's oh. a painter. Um, my dad's so father everyone's was, handy yeah yeah my literally my entire family both my mom and my dad's side are in construction my mom's a steep roofer she does slate and tile roofing wow um she wasn't her original job but that's what she does now uh and uh all of her brothers and sisters do carpentry or painting or some trades in some regard except one, but same with my dad. My dad's dad was also in construction. I believe he was a plumber or something. Um, and like all of our family friends, construction, tradesmen, they either work on the railroad, you know. Are you I'd, handy yourself? Can you make stuff? Yeah, I like I built sets. Like I can build stages and yeah. sets and stuff. I did that in high school. I built the set, I helped build the set for rabbit ears. <laughs> A TV show that game show that we did for incubator. Um, so I can do all that stuff and I don't mind doing it. And I think it's kind of fun, but for a career, I knew that I didn't want to do that. And um, I always loved the idea. Like I loved what we watched movies growing up like crazy. My parents showed us so many movies growing up. So I loved movies. I loved watching them. I was always into it. And I always loved watching behind the scenes. I was like, that's so cool how they're doing it, right? So I kind of got bit by the bug a little bit. But um, I don't know. I remember the exact moment that I was like, oh, I know what I want to do now. And it just kind of clicked. My um, dad's friend dropped off uh, all six Star Wars movies on DVD. Because I never seen all of them. I only saw like. I see the uh, behind you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah there it is <laughs> um so i've never I, at that time I, it was a freshman year in high school i'd never seen any of the any of the movies i only saw attack of the clones and i put in the original movie um just like cool i'm just gonna watch all these movies great i've always wanted to see them and then like the opening title crawl 
Star Wars, like, bah, and then it just clicked, like, oh, I want to do that. And I said out loud, like, oh, I want to do that. That's what I want to do. Mm-hmm. When the title says, like, that's what I want to do. It just came out. Yeah. I was like, shit, okay, I want to direct movies. And I didn't know what directing meant. And as I went you, along you, the way. Right. You, you, just, you just knew that you wanted to make something like that that made you feel yeah. that way happen. You want, like, whatever, yeah. whatever I got to do to make something like that, I'll do it. Yeah. I like because I like I didn't grow up in you know uh, like an artsy fartsy family like Mm -hmm. I didn't know anything I I didn't know anything about theater until I got to high school Mm -hmm. I didn't know anything about music until I got to middle school and really started exploring it in in high school like literally like all of like my dad grew up on a farm didn't go to high school my grandfather's from Ireland, didn't go to school, nor my grandmother. So it, we're not college educated. Like I'm the only one in my family that's college educated next to my sister. Mm-hmm. So like, you know, intellectually and like philosophically, like reasonings for doing film because of story or for messaging and thematics to change perceptions, like that was not on my radar. And that mm-hmm. didn't come till college. Yeah. Um, so I knew that I, I just fell in love with the medium i fell in love with the concept of like oh movies that sounds fucking cool and i really want to do that i don't know what it is i don't know what it means i don't know how this thing works but i love it so much that that's what i want to do and when i kind of caught that bug i knew that okay this is like artsy fartsy like this is like it could be a hard you know like um this could be a very hard career path. So I'm going to explore a bunch of different options. So in high school, I was like, I'm going to do film for sure, but I'm going to see if there's other things that I could do Mm because I wanted to make sure, you know, and I explored tons of different ideas for career options. Like I love psychology and sociology. And I thought about doing that. I was like, no, I thought about law school. I was like, no, I thought about joining the union several times, even throughout college, going to be a carpenter. And every time I was just like, no, like, I know I'm not going to be happy if I do any of those things. If I do any of those, I'm not going to be happy. Sales or business even. So I knew that I just wanted to do it. And I wanted to make movies. And I didn't know what type of movies yet. And part of me is still trying to explore it. But I know that I want to like make movies because in college, I really kind of just became a firm believer that you know, narrative storytelling is such a powerful tool to, you know, give new perspective to people's experiences, to their problems, to solutions, to problems. And for me, like, I really want to like tell stories that think outside the box, offer a new perspective to situations, to relationships, to problem solving. Um, and, uh, like like a movie that really stuck with me i watched blazing saddles for the first time sometime in high school which if you haven't seen it yeah no i love it yeah incredible and that movie i when i after i saw it i was like that was the smartest movie i've ever seen in my entire life because it's so silly but you also come out of it say you're right no but it's also like wow that was really intelligent it's so smart and the movies that I want to make movies like that, that's like, oh, I could tell just a story, personal story that people could really gravitate towards and really just enjoy watching. But at the end of it, they get a message out of it or they get like a piece of life advice, a solution to take with them when they're approaching a problem in life or a new perspective on a topic or something you know, that's positive, positively can like help inspire somebody or change somebody or like give more insight to a situation or a discussion or a topic. And I think going back to Blazing Saddles, like that was such a smart commentary on, you know, you know, racial tensions in the 1970s and how Mel Brooks and Richard Pryor and Gene Wilder were able to just like relate the 1970s to the 1870s 
was just so right. brilliant, you mm-hmm. know? And, and, you know, it's just like Steven Spielberg, I've, he's my, one of my favorite directors. He's the one I grew up watching and he does such a great job with finding that really good balance of that avant-garde and mass appeal to find that bridge of, oh, here's characters that people can connect with. You can really learn something valuable from it. They're very well-made movies, you know? Mm. Does that make any sense at all? <laughs> no, that, that was, was, like that I just was a great answer. I was, that probably was one of the, I mean, there have been a lot of guests who've, who've answered that question really well, but that was, yeah. I, uh, yeah. I, uh, I definitely uh, feel, I feel what you're throwing down there. Um, I, I think a lot of people feel that way when they when they go about this, especially when they when they come from a from a background where it's not artsy fartsy. No one mm. has ever done anything in the entertainment industry, and you're just like, this doesn't make any sense. Why I'm into this. But yeah, I couldn't imagine not being into this. Yeah, so I figure out how to do it. I have been struggling with that for the last four years of college. For like, what specifically? It's that like I don't come from an artsy background. Mm-hmm. You know, like my brain is wired to be a tradesman, to be a carpenter. Like my body, my brain, the way I think, the way I move, the way I do things, like that's how like I'm wired, Yeah. you know, but I don't want to do any of that. And so I'm on this constant, constant, constant uphill battle artistically and just the overall mindset Mm -hmm. to be a director is just the complete opposite of, you know, it is. It is because because don't you feel like at times like sometimes you know it's weird because I feel like we all like to think feel that we're like when people are born we're all blank slates but yeah. really like we all we're very I think like genetically we're influenced by our ancestors like if we come from a certain background we kind of feel that way yeah and so then when when you have this like. I don't want to call it a defect because it's a really beautiful thing. But when you have that, when you're like someone like you or me that feels that that essence of like, okay, I know this isn't really like I'm drawn to this thing that isn't the mindset yeah. that I'm going to need to acquire is not like the mindset that the people who came before me in my lineage had to acquire. I have to mm-hmm. acquire something that's completely different. And that's yeah. going to take a lot of mental effort and energy and learning. A shit ton of learning yeah like it's worth it. yeah like for me it's like i struggled in high school uh i mean not so much in high school but you know in college especially and sometimes in high school too was i'd be at i would do i would be on stage correct like that's the other thing too like i did theater but i wasn't an actor i wasn't an assistant director like i was a stage manager So I was all business, right? I was running the show, you know? Um, And I was also doing set construction um, and leading all that. So I wasn't even doing directing, like artsy stuff. You know what I mean? Well, you were basically like the first AD and the production designer equivalent in theater, though, when you think about it. Well, yeah, more like an art director, you know? More like I was kind of, you know, but yeah. Like what, what always boggled my mind is that in high school, you know, we did my senior year uh, really showed like my skills in carpentry. And it wasn't like I could be like an expert craftsman at, you know, when I was that age, but in terms of like just construction of, of units and pieces of structure in terms of wood. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Um, Like we were doing the musical Bye Bye Birdie. And uh, that was my senior year. So I, there was about, I believe 10 people on stage crew for that musical that were doing set construction. And so our set, and I'll draw it out as I talk because it's kind of interesting. (laughs) interesting (laughs) It was really weird. It was just a traditional, like, you know, three wall set or whatever, right? 
But there was like a section here, right? Where this was like the front of the stage, obviously. So here is like the, there's like an elevated platform. Yeah. And so on this elevated platform, if you'd walk up to the set, it was like up one foot platform and then up two more feet was another platform. So there mm -hmm. was this four foot by eight foot, four foot high yeah. elevated platform where they had to put place a bed on top of it. Someone mm -hmm. was dancing on it and they had to sleep on it or whatever. And I built this thing in like a half hour out of two by four and one by That's four. That's impressive. And like one in like, what was it? It was like three eighths sheet plywood all by myself. Well, here's the thing. I, I also did theater in high school. I was and more I was on the like, action side, but I would watch people make stuff and it takes a long time for you to have done yeah. that in a half an hour. And I know that that's like, that's not easy. It's more, maybe it's more like an hour, but like, you know, we would go, we would be in tech from like three to six after every day. So I finished that whole thing in like a day, yeah, know, like three hours or whatever. Right. Maybe not a half hour. That's definitely not, <laughs> but like three hours. Right. I built that whole thing. But on top of that, then I had to like rebuild like a tiny piece of two step stairs. Um, then I built like three flats Right. So I built like half the set in like mm -hmm. two days and I'm looking at myself and I'm like, I know it's not the prettiest thing. Right. Cause it's not that great looking. Like there are better people that could do a better job than me, but I'm like, why can't I just love doing this? Like I have the skill set for it. Like I have the knack for it. It's mm -hmm. like, why can't I just love doing this? But of course, what's always struggling is like, I have to love something that doesn't come naturally to me that I have to learn from the complete ground up and I'm not that. hating that I love it because it's like okay this is interesting but it's like it's like I always like wondered like why my brain decided to do that yeah like, why did my brain decide no you're not gonna like pursue a career in all this something mm -hmm. that you're clearly could be good at you're gonna yeah. go pursue something that is extremely difficult for you because it doesn't work with your your neurology you know what i mean yeah. it's always, yeah, no, that's always like like that has always been on my mind it's like why does my brain why did the universe have me decide that oh i want to go be a filmmaker i don't get it <laughs> i don't get it that's but that i is, love it the paradox of it all but the paradox I is all that you that, that you have you have a skill and and by any measure, like anyone else, like our society, you know, tends to be, un unfortunately, it's a lot of time, like, you know, you pick, you pick practicality yeah, over inspiration. Yeah, which, it's like, why couldn't I pick practically sometimes? Or like, why did my brain not let me pick practically? Yeah, but aren't you happier that you picked inspiration instead? 100%. Like, again, it's not practical and there will be struggles that you'll have to yeah, do yeah. that, you, that you'll have to endure because you didn't pick practicality, at least especially in the beginning. Yeah. But, 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 but you, it's, it's almost like there was like, again, don't want to use the word defect because it's I don't look at it as a defect, but it's like you, at some point, you just understand that there's no way in hell that I could ever work in an office. I worked in an office, Ronan. I would kill myself. I would too. <laughs> I would kill myself. Like that's not. I. I and I. I don't want to just say yeah. that because I know a lot of people are like, hey, you shouldn't say that because of you know depression and all that. And I totally, I totally respect anyone who's actually mm -hmm. going through that, going through actually like a clinical depression. But right, right, right. I, I did those kind of jobs, and that's how I felt. Yeah, like I, felt I even. Like, yeah. Yeah, because like I. That was the other thing too, is because when I like got bit by the bug and like I tried all that stuff in high school, like I just realized like, you know, when I was deciding on the career stuff, like I don't want to do anything else but this. Mm -hmm. Like I've really thought about it. I really like I worked as a chef in Lincoln Park for like six months at a bar flipping pizza, my favorite food. I was getting paid pretty decently. I was running a kitchen, right? Like I had a career set up. And I was like, you had it, you had it, you had this, but, that, but that's what so many people would yearn for. With what and I was like, in that moment, I was like, I fucking hate this. Get me the <laughs> hell out of here. I don't want to be a chef. Now, granted, 
like the place I worked at wasn't like probably the best spot to be in to like be a chef. They just right. didn't have things quite um, set up to be to really explore like the craft of chefing, I guess. But regardless, um, cutlery, you whatever. I don't know. Yeah. yeah. Regardless, right. though, like being there, I was like, sure, flipping pizzas is fun. Now I know how. Now I know that skill. Now I know how to run a kitchen. Sure, fine. But I don't want to do that. You know, like that just like, oh, I, yeah. and if you love food, like, I love food. And if you love food, like by all means, like be a chef. Like I could see why people like, it. I mean, it cooking is an know? art. I, I, find, yeah, I think it is. I totally agree. But like, I was just like, man, I really don't want to do this, you know? Yeah. And like, you know, it's sometimes in college, I was like, you know, maybe cooking is okay. I could do that. I could settle for that. Or maybe I could settle for this or I could settle for this. But then, like my like this year kind of came around, and I was just kind of like, no, fuck that. Like I'm I don't want to settle for any of those jobs, you know, because I know that like I, it just I, I never saw myself really doing anything else because I tried picturing myself in those jobs. What would I be oh, yeah. like, or how would I respond to it? And I just was like, no, I don't see myself doing that. I don't want to do it. And this is the only thing I want to see myself doing. And I'll just see where it takes me. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's the great leap of faith. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I guess, because I really just want to like, get to like the heart of this, like what, what would you say to someone who is dealing with the paradox, this, this paradox that we're talking about where they feel like, you know, I don't come from an art background. I don't know everything about filmmaking yet. And like, I have these doubts about doing this and I can maybe see myself doing other jobs, even though I probably wouldn't be as fulfilled. And like, what would you say to that person? Like, how do you, how did you, I guess, kind of mentally get past that paradox or maybe you're still doing it? yeah um see if you're like if you're in high school and you're really unsure if you want to do film there's nothing wrong with just going to college like if you know you want to go to college mm -hmm. but you're unsure if you want to pursue film um oh my gosh my brother's yelling <laughs> apologies um it's okay like if you really if you know you're here's the thing if you know you're going to go to college you're unsure about film. There's nothing wrong with majoring in film for your first year to see how you like it. Mm -hmm. Just take a couple of classes in each different field. Who cares? It's college. It's what, you know what yeah. I mean? And mm -hmm. it's elective credit, you can transfer over. And if you don't like it after the first semester, then you know for sure, okay, that's then you, not your Then effect. you really should, yeah, if you don't love it, then you really shouldn't do it. If you don't love it after taking like a variety of classes, don't do it because mm -hmm. it's one of those careers where you have to be all in mm -hmm. it's not something like yeah you know it's fine yeah like, i kind of dig it i kind of like it i like writing you sometimes. know like you it, know it's i would that's what i would say like if you're really if you know you're going for college then like there's nothing wrong with taking a few classes i would encourage you to do so because then you'll get that thought out of your mind that what if and right. that's the killer is yeah. that what if what if I did this? So you don't classes. have to regret it at that point because you at least tried. Right. You, you looked you looked on the other side of the wall. Yeah. And um, I would say on top of that too, if you're deciding on whether or not to pursue film, I would say be very certain that this is what you want. And it's tough because sometimes maybe you're still unsure about it, but you really still want to do it. And I think mm -hmm. that's one thing. If you know you want to do film, but you're not sure about what type of your part in film you want to do, but you still want to pursue it, I think that's okay to still do it. Yeah. But if you don't know if you want to do film in general, um, and like if you're not like, if it's not like on your mind every day, like if you're not like salivating over the idea of working in the industry or just like being on set, like if you're not craving it, like if you're not like on the edge of your seat, like, oh my God, I'm 
jump at any moment to just get a PA gig or just like swap the swap floors for universal or whatever. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like if that's not like not your mentality to like, I want it that badly. Like I want to like, just get all over it. You know? Yeah. If you just want to get on it. If that's how you're feeling, like, dude, go do it. Yeah. Just do it. Then but it, it's the right call. Yeah. Cause then you'll figure out as you're pursuing it, where you where you want to work in it yeah and, and I think all that's those... not as important as whether or not to do mm-hmm. it yes i agree with that 100 percent. and i think all of the information all of that information that you don't know and all those unknowns that make you scared if you're so if you get committed to it you will take the time to learn it and all of those answers will be revealed to you exactly I mean, like you you will figure it out exactly like I know friends that graduated with just a BA, no concentration, and that's fine. Part of yeah. me is still like, oh, I like to, I, I know I want to direct, but it's like, what do I want to direct? I'm still all over the place with like, oh, a document, I really want to do comedies. Like that's my number one I want to do. But oh, I really love documentaries. And I have so many documentary ideas. I love action movies. I really want to do action movies. I really want, I really love dramas and like, oh, I feel like horror would be really fun. So it's like, gosh, trying to figure that out, you know? So like, that's always, that's something you'll just figure out. Um, so if you're in, I, I think those are the two things. If you're in college, you're unsure, take a few classes. Um, if you're yearning for it, you're itching for it. Like you can't not stop thinking about it. You're getting thirsty over it, do it. But if you can safely say, I would be 100% fine with a nine to five job and I could probably live without pursuing film and be okay and be happy that I didn't pursue it then just don't do it because it's a lot, a lot of effort that you have to put into it. It's a very emotionally invested thing and physically being on set for like 12 hours a day. And if you feel like, yeah, I could just do a nine to five, totally fine, whatever, then maybe not bother doing it because it'll probably just save you the headache of pursuing it and then have that guilt of, oh, I committed. And if I back out of it, then I feel like I'm, you know what I mean? Right. Going through that struggle. Yeah. But, you know, there's nothing wrong. Like if, and there's nothing wrong with like saying, like saying that because like, it's not for everybody. And like, that's okay. Like you got to find something that's going to fit your best interests. You got to find something that's going to like really make you happy. Yeah. You know, um, and if it's more, if you're thinking that more or less because it's maybe like fear, I would just say like, fuck the fear and just keep going with it. Cause you, you never know if you're not in college, I don't know because right. never, it's too, it might be too early for you to say. Yeah. If you're in high school, I, I would still apply that same logic of if you're, if you're just like yearning to do it, like if you're all over it. You know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, like, if you know and you really know, then just be confident that you know. Yeah. Just, you just have to follow that and you'll know if, oh, this was a false positive or something, you know? Yeah. Um, and yeah, like that was, yeah. Cause for me, I, for a second, I was like, oh, archaeology. Yeah. I can do that. I took two archaeology classes and I was like, nope. Don't want to do that. <laughs> And that was like, cool, false positive. I don't, I'm not excited about archaeology anymore because I tested it out and not for me, you know? Um, yeah. I almost, I almost minored in journalism, actually. I, t- I took one, I mean, I, I always, I always knew that film was, television was the destiny, but I was, but I sort of bought into that BS where it's like, you have to have a backup plan kind of a thing. Yeah. And and so I admired in journalism and then I took one journalism class and I was like, this is a waste of time. And why are you, now you're reallocating time out of you doing what you need to do into this minor. Yeah. I'm kind of like, if you're a filmmaker, don't do a minor. Like just don't, because that shows yeah. that you're kind of insecure about your decision a little bit. And, and I was probably insecure about the decision that I made when I decided to minor, like my freshman year. Like, yeah. I was a little insecure about it, but then I realized like, no, this is BS. Stop this. Get rid of this minor. Yeah. I was always told 
by several, I used to do community theater in Oak Lawn. It was awesome. They're, they're so good. And the director there at the time, Paul Nierchi, uh, I told him I was majoring in film and he's like, do you have a minor? And this guy, he's been doing theater for 30 years. He's like, do you have a minor? And I was like, nope, don't have a minor. He's like, you need to get a minor. I'm telling you, man, this business is tough. Believe me, I get a minor, see, get a minor, get a minor. That's the trap because everyone, everyone's thinking practically. Yeah. And it's moment. like, I it totally, makes sense. I totally respect the idea of getting a minor. And like, that's totally cool. Um, just don't put too much effort into your minor. Remember that that's not what you're majoring in. You're majoring right. in your major. And if you're putting more effort in your minor. Probably means that you're not secure about means, your major. That means you should probably just make that minor your major. Yeah. But, you know, it's tough because I can't really like say like if you're just scared about it. For me, it's like if you're just if you're too scared of the thought of doing film because it just feels too scary to you then it might just be better off avoiding it. But if you're just, un if you're scared because you just don't know what you want to do in it. And you're just kind of ignorant about, about, about like, right. Like you're just ignorant about the process of it. You'll figure that out. Yeah. Like, don't, don't worry be, about it. Yeah. I wouldn't worry about it. And like, if you're a kid in high school, like kind of tell yourself, like, do I, am I yearning for this? Like, do I really like want to sit like, are you salivating over the idea of being on set or just being anywhere in film? Right. Then, then just go do it. If you're not sure. And if you're somebody that's not in college, but you want to do film, uh, just do you, if one, I would just ask like, if you love watching movies all the time, then that's a good start. Uh, if you like writing, yeah. that's a good sign. That's just start writing sign. a bunch. There's nothing wrong with just YouTubing stuff. Masterclass is kind of cool. Masterclass is great. Reading books Read to the scripts. library. Reading scripts. Yeah. Like if you love doing all of that, then save the money to go to film school. If you don't have the money, then just make a bunch of really weird short films with what you can and with what you know. Keep reading up and just do it that way. Like yeah. James Cameron never went to film school. Tarantino never went to film school. Tarantino, I don't think, finished high school really no so you can learn a lot from just reading like six books from DePaul's well, and, just, and just by watching movies and teaching yourself I mean I feel that like too. Yeah. as much as like film school I think has its benefits I feel like the a filmmaker has to be at least a majority self-taught like you teach oh, yeah. yourself yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. You can go to classes and like do that. And that's, that's great supplemental work. That's great supplemental stuff. But like you yeah. write, you read scripts, you watch a ton of movies, you go on sets. Yeah. You put yourself out there. That's really where you become who you are as mm. a filmmaker. Yeah. Like if you're sitting there and you're just loving, if you just want, if you're, like if you graduate high school, you never went to college, you're still kind of exploring things. And if you love movies, you're kind of bouncing the idea of majoring a film or doing something with it. And if you're sitting there and you're just, oh, I would love to learn how they did this. You're analyzing it and you're trying to pick the movie apart. Then just go take a film class yeah. and really learn more about it. And if you feel like, oh yeah, I kind of like this, then just keep going at it. Yeah, you learn know? the and, next thing and just go the next thing. And yeah. don't, don't feel like you gotta like, know everything today because if you feel that way then you're going to be like and then yeah. you'll get scared exactly and then none of your work will be good <laughs> yeah or or you'll be just frozen and you're just gonna like i don't yeah. want to i don't know you know another way i've thought about it and this is kind of just more like general career advice that i've kind of learned is that like if you know that if you're doing work and it doesn't feel like work it just feels like it's fun yeah then that's what you should be doing yeah. if you're reading like a case memo for for just like some court that happened and you're just like this is so fucking exciting holy shit this is be, cool you should be a lawyer you should be a lawyer if you're like reading a script and you're just like god damn like this is so damn cool like i sit here and read hundreds of these or you just watch movies and just if you're breaking down a movie based and you're just researching movies and you're just, you should be majoring in movies you should be majoring in film 
You know, it's the same thing with business. If you're just, if you just love the idea of selling and selling and just being a salesperson, working in customer service, being around people, then you should be around people and you should be doing that. Mm -hmm. You know, find like some work that you get really excited about, you know, explore that stuff. If it's, it doesn't have to be like super specific, like, oh, making a movie or maybe lawyer stuff, but like find those things like, oh, well, I really like working with people. Let me explore options with working with people. You know, I really like managing and scheduling and organizing. So let me find jobs and careers that are based around that. Everyone's, everyone's really good at something. That's the thing. Yeah. Like everyone's really, I mean, there is no one on earth who's not really good at one thing. And the thing, yeah. the problem is people assume that when they, when they're trying to like analyze, like what their talent or gift is, they always assume like, well, if it's not singing, if it's not something really glamorous, if it's not like a lawyer, a doctor, or a businessman, then then it's not, it's not you know, yeah. worth it. But think about it like this: the person who made like Kentucky Fried Chicken, Colonel Sanders, like all he did was make fried chicken, but his fried chicken was so good and could reach so many people. Like that was the thing. Like that yeah. was his gift, was just he knew how to cook chicken right. And I, as a as a vegan, I don't have KFC anymore. But I'm just saying, yeah. Like it doesn't have to be the obvious ones that everyone points to. It could be yeah. just networking. Are you a good networker? People can use you for something. Yeah. Like if there's something that you really get excited about, just like the idea of like, oh, I love the idea of just writing down a story and like building characters and moving things around then you should probably go write stories. Yeah. You know, if it's like, oh, I love money and I love how like, you know, just money, the concept of it and how it works. I love financing and numbers and like putting spreadsheets, then you should go do finance or accounting or something. You know, that's how I've looked at it. And it's tough because you can go throughout all throughout high school, try all those things and be like, I don't know. Yeah. And that's tough. And uh, at that point, I would say just doesn't matter. You're t- fucking 18. You graduate high school. Go work a bunch of weird fucking jobs as much as you can. You'll find something. Yes. You know? Because who cares? You're 20. Who doesn't cares? matter. Who cares? No one's yeah. watching. No one cares what you do. Like, I mean, like, maybe your parents and friends will have ideas of what you should do, but it's like yeah. not their lives. So it's not their life. Point, they got to back them. off, you know? Yeah. yeah. And and it's kind of tough because if, you know, my parents helped me out with paying for college. So like, mm-hmm. I kind of got to, I got to put, I got to put, you know, I can't just not go do film after college. You know what I mean? My parents are like, well, yeah, hey, no, I mean, you know, my parents would be like, yeah. it's kind of the nice thing because, because they're very supportive of the fact that what I'm doing. And if I stopped doing it after college, they'd be like, why the fuck did we send you to film? So like, what, like, what? Yeah. Like, no, what my was dad, the fucking point? Yeah, my dad would be so pissed. Oh, you yeah. Know? My parent, my mom would be too. They'd be like, why did we do that? You know, so it's Which like, you're going to go. It yeah. feels good. That's like, they would be upset if I didn't do the thing. Yeah. Because like my parents, my parents, my parents are the parents, parents. They're, that are like, um, it's like, if you're going to do something, like don't half-ass it. Mm-hmm. You know, right. my Just parents. really, really yeah. care about something and want to do it well yeah because if i came out of if i graduated film school and i went up to them and if they wouldn't say this like these exact words but this is how it would come across like if they said if i said i don't want to do film more and then you know they they would say like what are you fucking giving up like that's it like mm-hmm. you didn't put any work in like fucking pansy like get your ass at, at least fail a couple pansy. of times you know yeah yeah you know it's like it's like what are you scared like what are you wuss like what are you doing you know like that they'd come out with like it wouldn't be like oh well you, fuck you you just wasted my money It'd be like what are you doing stop being lazy go do it you know that's like kind of the approach they kind of do it. they wouldn't say it like that <laughs> you yeah. know they they say it like that but they'd be like stop being a yeah they'd be like come on man like what's what's yeah. up like, what is this yeah. yeah yeah it's kind of like this it's nice, nice little support thing because it's like 
oh, I'm expecting you. It's like, oh, I'm expecting you that you're going to do this. So I know that you're a filmmaker. So why aren't you doing it? You know, mm -hmm. it's like they, it's like they've been, it's like if they were an employer, it's like you're employed, you know, in their minds. It's like, okay, why aren't you doing a better job? Your efficiency is down. You know what I mean? Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we're, I mean, in most jobs, an employer is holding you accountable. Whereas if you're a filmmaker, you are you are the only one holding yourself accountable. I mean, you're and especially in the beginning when you're an independent, you're the, you're your own boss completely. Mm -hmm. You're setting the pace and the tone for everything. You're like an entrepreneur that way. Yeah, like it is very much like that. It's your skin, like it's all your decision on how it goes. Mm -hmm. Which is both, which is the amazing part, but I feel like for a lot of people, it's also the terrifying part. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. Well, damn, man. Um, I think we threw down a lot of nice golden nuggets of information. <laughs> yeah, I hope everything I said made actual logical sense because I, I thought I it made a lot. I legit, I thought everything you said made very logical sense. Um, awesome. <laughs> yeah. I, I really I really enjoy talking to you, man. This, this, yeah. this was a really fun time. Yeah, I'm glad you invited me on. I had a lot of fun. You know, love to do it again. Had a lot of fun just chit chatting. Felt yeah. good. You know, just a chit chat. Yeah, no, this 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 was amazing. Um, I will definitely. Where can people find you? Oh, um, <laughs> I'm not active on social media that much. Okay, if you Instagram. have an account and someone wants to ask you a question about something, where should they, how should they do that? Uh, you, you can find me on Instagram. That'd probably be the best way. Um, and just have them DM you? Yeah, that's fine. That's fine. <laughs> that's fine. I don't care. That's that. fine. <laughs> yeah, whatever. You can do that if you want. Yeah, it's fine. Yeah, no, I, I, I'm not too picky on like how you reach out to me. Like if you DM me through Instagram, if you find me on LinkedIn, if you find me on Vimeo, uh, Facebook even, that's yeah. fine. Same name across all of them. Um, it, picture looks like this. So yeah, it was, it was something like, like that. <laughs> yeah, I think Instagram, it's like Ronan underscore Morrissey one or something like that. I don't know, but it's a black and white picture. It looks like this. Yeah, that's how you find me. So if you want to talk to me, whoever's watching, you can do that. <laughs> I, I, I would highly recommend it, guys. Um, thank you so much, Ronan, man. I really, again, seriously, I love every time we talk or we do a, a thing like the midnight pancakes thing, I've always enjoyed. I've always enjoyed it. So awesome. I'm you. glad I'm glad you enjoy talking to me because I talk a lot and it can get tiring. <laughs> I, but yeah, you know, you talk a lot, but but it's never bad talk. You know what I'm saying? Like sometimes, you know, people oh. talk and they're just like, they wander, they're not succinct, they're not funny or charismatic, and it's like really difficult and like, you know, but thank you for not being that. Awesome. Well, I'm glad I wasn't that. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so I, much. I deeply appreciate it. Well, man, I'll, uh, I'll catch you later. Yeah, I'll catch you later. See man. you later. All right. Thank you, man. No problem.